NASCAR might be headed to Long Beach as early as 2025, and Denny Hamlin reveals he might drive for 23-11 racing in the not-so-distant future. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. We got a ton of NASCAR and other motorsports stories discussed here today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just show you those really, really quickly. We're first going to take a look at a ton of paint schemes that have been revealed over the course of the last couple days. Let's go and just jump straight into them. The first paint scheme we're taking a look at is Ryan Ellis' 2024 Southern Elevator scheme that we're going to see in a few races in 2024, including this weekend at Richmond. This paint scheme saw, in my opinion, I'm glad to see that Southern Elevator is working with Ryan Ellis. He's had a lot of sponsorship this year. Good to see him working with Southern Elevator this weekend. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Noah Grayson's 2024 Superior Essex scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Richmond. This one is different than the other Superior Essex schemes that we've seen this year. I think it does look pretty good and I'm looking forward to seeing on the racetrack this weekend at Richmond. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Michael McDowell's 2024 Long John Silver scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Richmond. Obviously, Bob Jenkins has been working with Long John Silvers for many, many years. I think this looks decent in my opinion. Looking forward to seeing on the racetrack at Richmond. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Todd Gillen's 2024 Farsica scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Richmond. Like this a lot in my opinion and glad to see that Farsica will be working with Todd Gillen this weekend. The next main scheme we're taking a look at is John Hunter Nemechek's 2024 Safeway scheme that we'll see this weekend at Richmond. This one looks solid in my opinion, not spectacular, but I think it does look solid. Looking forward to seeing on the racetrack this weekend at Richmond. The next main scheme we're taking a look at is Bailey Curry's 2024 Sparco scheme that we're going to see in multiple races in 2024. Sparco, pretty big brand. I think this looks pretty good in my opinion, and glad to see that Sparco will be working with Bailey Curry this weekend. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Dean Thompson's 2024 McKee scheme that we're going to see in a couple weeks at Texas. I like the red. I like the colors on it. I think that they did a pretty good job on this paint scheme overall, to be honest with you. And the final paint scheme we're taking a look at is Daniel Suarez's 2024 Quaker State scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Richmond and a couple of the races throughout the 2024 season. I really love this paint scheme. I've always seen Trackhouse does a really great job in the majority of their paint schemes. This one's no exception. I think did an amazing job overall, and I'm definitely looking forward to see on the racetrack this weekend. I think it looks really great and looks phenomenal overall, to be honest with you. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Hyvee. As it was reported by Adam Stern earlier this morning that Hyvee is becoming a partner of NASCAR Holding as part of the Racing Properties' first ever Premier Series weekend at Iowa later this year. On top of that as well, they are going to sponsor the Xfinity Series race, which should be called the Hyvee Perks 250. Hyvee's had a big interest in IndyCar for the last couple of years, and with obviously a NASCAR going to Iowa Speedway for the Cup Series for the first time, Hyvee is getting involved in a pretty major and massive way. We already know that the Cup Series race at Iowa Speedway has sold out for the weekend, and in general, I think it's amazing to see that Hyvee is going to be stepping up and working with NASCAR for their premier event. I think it's an incredible move for the sport in general, and nonetheless, really happy and glad to see that this is going on currently at the moment. I don't know what this means for the future of Hyvee, and IndyCar's branding going forward, but in general, I think it's really exciting for the sport overall and glad to see that Hyvee will be working with them going forward. And now we're going ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Denny Hamlin. There's a lot of things surrounding Denny Hamlin we're going to talk about in this episode. This came from an article that I think Adam Stern had from Sports Business Journal with Denny Hamlin. But Denny Hamlin reveals that he's working to get Nike's Jordan brand to produce special 2311 merch that fans could buy only in person by visiting the team's new Airspeed headquarters near Charlotte. Obviously, the new shop that's going to be coming out really, really soon, they're getting close to being finalized for fans to go into. In general, it's really because, obviously, Denny Hamill's had affiliation with the Jordan brand in the last couple of years, been with that group for a very, very long time, and obviously with Michael Jordan owning the Jordan brand, of course, that's why Denny Hamill's working to get this done in this merchandise, which I think is going to be really cool to see once we all can get out to that shop. In general, I think it's really, really good and really cool to see. I nonetheless happy to see that Denny Hamlin is working to get this done. I think this is huge for the sport overall and really huge for 2311 racing fans in general. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Taylor Ferns. As it was announced yesterday that Taylor Ferns will drive for Able Motorsport on ovals in Indian XT starting I believe at Iowa Speedway later this year. Taylor Ferns, who, for those who don't know, has been competing in the USAC Silver Crown Series and also is a reporter and writer as well. 
She's been making her way up through the ranks, and this is an amazing and great opportunity for her. I think her goal ultimately is eventually get into IndyCar and race her, maybe on ovals and road courses as well. I think it's a great opportunity for her, and I'm happy to see that she's getting the chance and opportunity to work with Able Motorsports, who's, of course, still trying to find a way to get to the Indy 500 this year, which I don't know if that's going to happen. They were one of the big, cool stories that was able to make it to the Indy 500 last year, and now she's getting the chance and opportunity to work with the team in 2024 amazing fantastic and great opportunity and glad to see the show get to work with able motorsports this year in any nxc in 2024 and now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about NBM Motorsports. As it was announced on Monday that NBM Motorsports will be running a couple more races in 2024 in the Cup Series. So Timmy Hill is going to drive a 6-6 car at North Wilkesboro for the All-Star Race, so they will have to qualify either way into the event. And then Davis Starr will be driving the car in the Coca-Cola 600. NBM Motorsports made their official return to the NASCAR Cup Series last weekend at Circuit of the Americas and were able to make the show and I believe finished in 36 or 37, but I believe were as able to complete every single lap in the race. This team obviously wants to run as many races as possible, try to build up, and I think ultimately long term they want to bring them to being back to being a full time organization in the Cup Series. And they're going to run, I believe, the Xfinity Series race as well this weekend, though the driver, to my understanding, has not been announced at this point and might be announced by the time you guys are watching this. So overall, I think it's really good to see the MBM Motorsports is officially going to be back and glad to see if they'll be back for a couple more races this year in 2024 and we'll see if they eventually decide to run full-time in 2025 because I think they would love to go full-time. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about North Wilkesboro. Now, it was reported yesterday by North Wilkesboro themselves that there was a sinkhole that happened at the racetrack. And according to them, the sinkhole has unearthed rumored moonshine cave underneath the grandstands. This is definitely one of the coolest stories that I think I've heard so far this year in 2024 because I know there's been a lot of rumors and speculation for many, many years that there were moonshine caves that were under North Wilkesboro Speedway. And now it's officially confirmed that there's a lot of truth and it's true that there were some underneath North Wilkesboro Speedway that was built. I think it's such a really cool story to see. I wonder how the moonshine tastes. That would be very interesting to look at for sure. And I wonder if anyone's going to try to go under there and investigate to see if there's any good moonshine under there or not. Because a lot of moonshine runners went under in those caves to go ahead and sell moonshine during the Prohibition era. So in general, I think it's really interesting and kind of fun to see. And I love the fact that North Wilkesboro was able to find us. I think it's pretty cool and pretty crazy overall, to be honest with you. And now we're going to hedge up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the tire test at Sonoma. So currently at the moment, by the time you're watching this, there is a tire test that's currently going on at Sonoma Raceway. You have Ross Chastain in the 1, Josh Berry in the 4, and Mark Truex who won the race last year at this track in the 19, currently testing. And they did media interviews after the test yesterday. And according to Mark Truex Jr. says, there is no tire fall, but they were going three seconds faster around the racetrack with this tire test, meaning they're probably going to be getting laps probably in the 109s the 110s when we go there later this year. Now, obviously, people are going to say, well, that's not a good thing. Well, it really isn't a shock or surprise to see is considering the fact historically when it comes to new repays, generally, there's not a lot of tire fall off on new repays. This doesn't shock or surprise me, to be honest. And honestly, Sonoma Raceway as a racetrack, no disrespect to people that love the track. I personally don't think the racing at Sonoma is generally really, really good. And I don't think it's that great. So overall, I'm not surprised or shocked to see that there's no tire fall off. Martin Church Jr. is saying it's not a shock there. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of tire tests coming up really soon. I think Bristol's got one that's going to be happening because of the tire issues that were going on at Bristol. I imagine that there's going to be a test there really soon. But again, it's cool to see that there was a tire test at Sonoma. I don't think it means the racing is going to be good. It's probably going to struggle, to be honest. But that does surprise or shock me, considering the fact that usually new repays do cause tire issues. And there's at least going to be more practice, which I think a lot of fans are going to be happy about overall. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Taylor Gray. As it was officially confirmed by Joseph Sergley and many reporters in the industry that Taylor Gray will officially make his NASCAR Xfinity Series debut this weekend in Richmond, driving the number 19 car for Joe Gibbs Racing. 
Taylor Gray is expected to make around 5 to 10 starts through 10 starts in 2024. Obviously, being full-time of the Chuck Series with Tricon Garage in the 17. It has been doing a really good job with that organization so far in 2024. Now, Taylor Gray obviously is going to have some pretty high expectations going in this event, considering he is going to be with Joe Gibbs Racing. But realistically, yes, I know Joe Gibbs Racing has been historically amazing at Richmond Racing. Look at all the wins that Kyle Busch has had and other drivers at JGR. But realistically, I think that Taylor Gray could get maybe a top 10. I don't expect him to win this weekend. I think he will be quick. Don't get me wrong. I just don't think he'll be a major threat and contender for the victory. So I think expectation-wise, I think the goal is to try to get a top 10. There's no issues in the owner's points going into weekend. So overall, it's a great opportunity for him, though. And hopefully Taylor Gray can make the best of it. But like I said, I don't think that Taylor Gray is going to be contender for the victory. I think realistically, a top 10 is a very good finish. If he can get a top 10, I think that'd be really solid and really good for him overall. Hopefully he gets a really good run this weekend at Richmond in the number 19 car in his Xfinity Series debut. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Thermal Club TV ratings. So a lot of people in the industry were wondering after the Thermal Club race for IndyCar how the ratings were going to be. And according to Adam Cern, NBC and Peacock got 816,000 viewers for IndyCar's Thermal Challenge. Once again, another bad TV rating for IndyCar. Look, I will say this. I tune in to the Thermal Club race. And I was not a big fan of the race overall. A majority of the fans and people in the industry were not really happy with the race. And a lot of people were expecting that number to be under a million because a lot of IndyCar fans were not a massive fan of the Thermal Club race. This does not shock me or surprise me, unfortunately. And trust me, I want to see IndyCar succeed, but there's been a lot of things going against it, and a lot of fans in general did not enjoy the Thermal Club race. Again, this does not shock me, and this does not surprise me. It's definitely disappointing for sure to hear, but once again, it does not surprise or shock me to see that the TV ratings are not that great for IndyCar, while NASCAR is continuing to go up. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But in general, it doesn't surprise or shock me to see that not even 850,000 people tune in to the NASCAR, not the NASCAR, the IndyCar race at the Thermal Club. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Xfinity Series Circuit of the America ratings. Now, Fox Sports put out a presser in regards to the Xfinity Series Coda ratings, and according to them, the Xfinity Series race delivered 891,000 viewers. That is up 10% from last year, where the race only had 815,000 viewers. Road course races in general do not absolutely do killer in the TV rating side of things. But once again, to see that the number continues to increase, especially with March Madness going around, I think is really good for the Xfinity Series because that means that the hardcore fan base is absolutely tuning in. Because like I mentioned, road course races don't generally do that great. If this race would have gotten a million, it would have been absolutely spectacular, but it is continuing to go up. And obviously you have the effect of Shane Van Gisbergen being there, even Haley Deegan being there. I think her being there is a big reason why that bumps increase because she is very, very popular. So I think it's a good increase for sure. The Xfinity Series has had some big increases there. I think they're up like 10 to 15% compared to last year. And once again, they're up double digit percentages in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. So I think it's a big win in general for the sport, at least for the Xfinity Series especially, and for the hardcore fan base. Really happy about this, and nonetheless glad to see that they were able to get this done and that the ratings are up, especially for the NASCAR Xfinity Series race. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Brandon Brown. Now, I saw this in interaction that was going on on Twitter between Brandon Brown and Mohawk Foundation. And apparently, they're talking about maybe sponsoring Brandon Brown in a race if he was ever to come back. And Brandon Brown basically says that he is he said, I might dust the helmet off and try to get back behind the wheel. Obviously, we all know the story of Brandon Brown, the LGB situation that happened a few years ago. And Brandon Brown was not the one who made the decision. His dad was the one who really played a role in what happened there. They tried to get an LGB coin into the sport. And obviously NASCAR denied that ever end up happening. And unfortunately since that point, Brandon Brown has not been in NASCAR in the last year or so. And it's a shame because Brandon Brown was on his way up. 
He was doing a really good job in the Xfinity Series, made the playoffs, if I'm not mistaken, that year, and won that race at Talladega. And I think the previous year, 2020, made the postseason that year. So he was a pretty solid driver in underfunded equipment. But unfortunately for Brandon Brown, his career really went down a hill, not really to his fault, unfortunately. It really was his dad's decision to make some of the decisions that he ended up making that kind of cost Brandon Brown's career in NASCAR overall, and he's not been back in the sport since. So to see that they're trying to find a way to maybe get him back in the sport, I think is really, really cool. And I hope it does end up happening, because I think for the sport overall, I think everyone would be very, very happy to see Brandon Brown make a return to NASCAR. I know a lot of people blame him and say that it was really his choice to do that kind of stuff, but overall, in general, I think it was a bad move for them, and it sucks to see that his career really got affected because of this. So I really hope that they can find a way for him to get back on the wheel, because I think it'd be really cool for him to get the chance and opportunity to once again race in the sport. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Rick Ware Racing. Now, it was reported by Bob Pockers on Monday evening that Rick Ware Racing will not appeal the disqualification for Justin Haley. Now, obviously, if you weren't, hadn't paid attention, I did a video on this after the NASCAR Cup Series race on Sunday. It was confirmed that Justin Haley had been disqualified after the NASCAR Cup Series race after crossing the line of 17th place because he failed minimum weight that you're supposed to have inside the car. I think if you have less weight, that can produce a little more grip, especially on a road course, and make your car a little bit faster. And it's a shame for the team. Obviously, some were wondering if they were going to appeal, but if they released a statement literally like, 20, 30 minutes after I released my video, and they basically said they were too light in tech and they weren't going to be appealing. This was the first disqualification for the NASCAR Cup Series, but not the first one in all three series in general, because for the NASCAR Truck Series earlier this year at Atlanta, Lane Rays got disqualified for, I think, minimum heights, if I'm not mistaken. It is disappointing to see, because we've been really praising Rick or Racing with the pace and speed they've been showing in recent weeks, and they have been a lot quicker throughout the last couple of weeks. So I really hope that they don't make any more mistakes. A lot of people are going to probably start accusing that team of cheating, which again, I wouldn't blame people for accusing them of cheating, but I don't think Rick or Racing was cheating. I just think they made a little bit of a mistake when it comes to that. So disappointing news for sure. It sucks that they're not going to try to appeal. I thought maybe they would try to appeal it, but in general, I'm also not surprised or shocked to see this. So it is disappointing for sure to see this, but not surprising also at the same time to see that they're not going to appeal the disqualification. Because a lot of times when it comes to disqualifications, a lot of teams do not win their appeal. So not surprised or shocked to see this overall, to be honest with you. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about DoorDash. Now, in the same article we talk about the Jordan brand, it was confirmed that DoorDash has ended its sponsorship deal not just with 2311 Racing, but also with NASCAR. DoorDash have been working with NASCAR since 2021, but they've been backing out slowly but surely over the course of the last couple of years and couple of seasons. And with DoorDash, from my understanding, struggling a little bit with funding and prices going up, I feel like that 23 Lime Racing is backing off on them as well. And the other thing to think about when it comes to DoorDash is they're obviously got a lot of other sponsorship working bubble walls this year. You've got Columbia. You've got Money Lions still working with the team this year. You've got other companies like McDonald's who's really stepped up to the plate. The Air Force has joined us here, which I think the Air Force is replacing a lot of those races. And then, of course, like I mentioned, McDonald's. And I think Dr. Pepper is also stepping up and sponsoring more races this year in 2024. 2311 Racing is not struggling with sponsors by any stretch of imagination. In fact, they're one of the few teams in NASCAR right now that I feel like is in a really good position when it comes to their sponsorship. And we might also see at some point like a Jordan brand paint scheme. And then, of course, we got Mobile One who stepped up in his sponsor bubble wall. They actually sponsored this past weekend at Circuit of the Americas. So they're not struggling right now for sponsorship and for funding, which is why I'm not really concerned about the situation when it comes to the funding and losing DoorDash. And obviously, a lot of people are going to start up using DoorDash because, again, prices have gone through the roof because everyone knows that the increase of prices and with the common goods and everything in the economy not being as good, teams are being a little more scarce when it comes to their spending. So I'm not shocked about this or surprised about this in any stretch of the imagination to see that DoorDash has backed off their sponsorship with 23 Eleven Racing and they're gone. In general, there were rumors that this was going to happen, and now it's officially confirmed to see that 23 Eleven Racing and DoorDash are no longer working together. That's another big sponsor gone, but to be honest with you, I'm not shocked and surprised to see this, to be perfectly honest with you. 
And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about track limits. Now, there has been a massive and a huge conversation surrounding track limits in the last week or so. Because during the NASCAR Xfinity Series, Truck Series, and Cup Race, there were nearly 50 track limit penalties that were accessed throughout the whole entire weekend. Now, Ellen Sawyer, who is the communications director, I believe, for NASCAR and SVP of competition, went on Sirius on NASCAR Radio yesterday to discuss this. And he says that NASCAR plans to work on track limits going forward and basically finding a way to change up the track limit penalties. Obviously, with NASCAR's ruling, you had if you went across the line in the S's because they were only accessing track limit penalties in one area, if you went across even like an inch, you were more than likely going to receive at least a pass-through penalty. And if you didn't reserve it by the end of the race, you were going to get a 30-second time penalty. Now, obviously, with how heavy these stock cars are, you're obviously going to make mistakes and you're not going to be picture perfect. Now, what is the solution in my opinion? Well, a lot of other major motorsports, they have warning systems. In supercars, you get two warnings before you get a time limit penalty. You get a three-strike system. For Formula One, you get three warnings, and then you start getting time penalties. And they don't access 30-second time penalties, by the way. They access five or even 10-second time penalties. Let's get, because I think it was over-agreed is on the penalties that NASCAR sent out. For example, Shane Van Gisbergen cut the corner very lightly, like an inch or so, and he got a 30-second time penalty at the end of the race, which, by the way, NASCAR did not hand it out to like five or ten minutes after the race, so we didn't know if he finished second or not because NASCAR took forever to announce that he got that penalty because NASCAR's communication had not been very, very good. The easiest solution, in my opinion, instead of just handing pass-through penalties out and 30-second time penalties, give them warning systems. Now, people are going to say they can exploit it, but I don't know if people are going to exploit it because they know they're going to have the warnings. I personally think that there should be a three-strike system. Do what Supercars does. You get two warnings, and then if you do it again, you get a five-second time penalty. But a 30-second time penalty or a pass-through is harsh for missing the corner. To me, I think that there needs to be changes to how they do it going forward, especially in road courses. And also, do track limits all the way around the racetrack. Don't just do it in one area of the track and don't do it just in that and don't access it around the rest of the track. It's either have it in all around the track or don't have it at all. Because everyone knows that these stock cars are really big and heavy. And personally, I think, we, like I said, we need a warning system when it comes to track limits. We'll see what NASCAR ends up doing in regards to that and see if they agree with me and they decide to go ahead and do it. But they're probably not going to do it because NASCAR is extremely inconsistent when it comes to those kind of things. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about a budget cap. Now, it was poured by Adam Stern yesterday that many teams are skeptical about the need for a budget cap to limit their spending, according to five people familiar with the matter. This is a conversation that's been surrounding because of the charter negotiations and the charter agreement that has been going on with NASCAR. Because even though the charter agreement was supposed to be finalized at this point, that still is not finalized and we are almost in April. Now, people in the industry do expect that the charter agreement is going to get finalized by the end of this year and probably maybe in the next couple months it could end up getting finalized. But the biggest thing that NASCAR is wanting is a budget cap. And they're wanting some sort of budget cap that the teams cannot spend a certain amount of money if they do agree to making the charter system completely permanent. But again, the teams, they want the charters to be completely permanent, but there's also a lot of talk that they could go with an evergreen deal. I don't know how I would feel about a budget cap, to be honest with you. I think there's certain reasons why I think a budget cap at least would make a little bit of sense. But even if you have a budget cap, the really good teams are still going to stand out as being the really good teams, and the teams that are not as good are going to still stand out as not being as great, though I will say the field is a lot closer nowadays in the Cup Series than I think it's ever been. The field's a lot closer, and it's a lot more competitive of the sport. Just look at the last three years of the next-gen era. I think there's been like 29 or 30 drivers that have gone to victory lane in the next-gen era. So in general, when it comes to some sort of budget cap, it would definitely be very interesting for sure, but I don't know how exactly it work. How would NASCAR enforce it? And what would they have someone there like they have in Formula One? Would that be the way that they'd enforce it? It's something that's going to be very interesting to fall on as time progresses. It's going to be something we'll keep our eyes out on for sure. And we'll see how things work out. But it's interesting. There's a lot of talk about a potential budget cap coming in the not-so-distance future. 
And now we're going to head up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Auto Club. As it was reported by Adam Stern last night that a Texas-based industrial developer and investor is revving up its engines to begin its conversion of a NASCAR racetrack in Southern California after landing $756 million in financing. This company is known as Hillwood. Hillwood is also behind the development of, I think, around 13 to 14 tracks and also is involved with Chicagoland Speedway as well, getting industrial complexes around the racetrack, though Chicagoland Speedway is still likely going to be around in the NASA distance future. And we're going to talk about that track later in this episode because it could have a future in NASCAR here really, really soon. But it's very interesting because NASCAR has still not gotten the track and short track built. They've been doing more destruction of the racetrack, but there hasn't been any sort of construction. Now, NASCAR is hoping to get Auto Club Speedway done by as early as 2026 so they can race there. And a lot of people do believe that they are going to get it done and they are going to end up racing there. But the problem is, is that it all costs a lot of money. Now, obviously, NASCAR made a ton of money, which, again, I personally don't blame them for wanting to spend a lot of money on the racetrack and they basically bought a lot of sold off a lot of land which they sold it off for a ton of money nearly a billion dollars so i don't blame nascar for doing that but a lot of people are very skeptical if auto club speedway is ever going to end up getting done because i think all of us do really want nascar to race at auto club speedway i won't because it's not going to be called auto club speedway when it does get done but a lot of us do want nascar to go there in the not so distant future race again and it's a shame they had to tear down the racetrack i think the racing auto club was phenomenal i think a lot of fans are very skeptical when they read the headline saying oh they're going to destroy auto club I'm not sure if they are because some think it's going to happen. Others think it's not going to happen. But it's a shame that the track hasn't even been worked on at this point. I mean, it's been five years since we know that Auto Club Speedway was going to get converted to the short track. And they've been demolishing the track for about eight, almost four or five months now. And nothing has been done to the track at this point. People expected it to get done. But we'll have to kind of wait and see. This is definitely a big story that we're going to follow up on as time progresses and goes on. In general, we'll see what ends up happening when it comes to the future of Auto Club Speedway and whether or not this racetrack will finally get done so we can go race there here very, very soon. I think a lot of us fans do want to race at Auto Club Speedway. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Circuit America TV ratings. As it was reported by Adam Stern yesterday that Fox got 3.31 million viewers for Sunday's NASCAR Cup Series race at Circuit of the Americas. That is up 6% from last year, which got 3.129 million viewers. That is still a very solid increase, and that is now the fifth straight NASCAR Cup Series race that has had an increased TV rates, which might be a record for NASCAR in recent years. That is a thumbs up in my opinion, but not as vast of an increase as we've seen in the previous four races. Now, why is it not up as much as other weeks? Well, one, I think a lot of those were Chase Elliott fans coming back. I think that's a big reason why it's increasing a little bit, because it was down still from 2022. But another big reason is because generally when it comes to road course racing, it doesn't do as good in TV ratings. That's why it's not up as much as we've seen races like Bristol or Phoenix, which Phoenix had nearly a 20% increase. But still 3.31 million for road course, especially on Fox, I think is still very, very good. And like I mentioned and said, outside of like the Chicago Street Course and maybe the Daytona Road Course, generally road course races don't do killer in the TV ratings. A lot of people thought this race even was going to be on FS1, which I believe after this week at Richmond, the rest of the Cup Series races are going to be on FS1, so we're probably going to see big drops once we get to race like Marsville going forward. But it has been good to at least see, and I think it's at least a positive for sure, to see at least in a certain extent that the ratings went up at least a little bit, and they went up more, more, and more. And I hope that that continues this weekend at Richmond, which I think it could increase considering that it is an Easter race, and people are going to be able to at least tune in for sure. It'll be something to watch for sure as time progresses and goes on, and we'll see if the Circuit America TV ratings or not just the start of a drop, and we can see more increases going forward in the future. Nonetheless, at least it's a positive to see that the TV ratings are up at least a little bit, in my honest opinion. I think it's a really big step up in a really good direction, at least. 
And now we're going to head up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Ty Dillon. Now, we did a video discuss this on the channel on Monday, but it was officially announced on Monday morning that Ty Dillon is going to drive a 16 car for college racing in the NASCAR Cup Series for five races in 2024. He'll drive a 16 this weekend at Richmond, then he'll race at Texas on April 14th, <clears throat> then he's going to race in New Hampshire on June 23rd, then he's going to race at Richmond in August, and his final race will be Kansas in September. September. Now, Ty Dillon, of course, currently drives full-time in the Truck Series for Rackler Racing in the 25 team, and so far the season of Rackley has not gone so well. Through the first five races of the year, his best finish is 11th and is still looking for his first top 10 of the Truck Series season and sits about 23rd or 24th in the Truck Series points. There were a lot of rumors last year that Ty Dillon was going to be driving the number 16 car for Colleg Racing in 2024 on even a full-time basis or a majority of the season. But unfortunately, sponsorship that Ty Dillon had, to my understanding, sadly fell through, which is why he's not full-time with this team this year. But this is a really great opportunity for him. But unfortunately, you look at this organization. They've had a lot of drivers that bring sponsorship and funding behind the wheel of this number 16 car. Shane Van Gisbergen is going to make eight starts all together. You've got, of course, got Derek Krause who made a couple starts, AJ Allmendinger, and Josh Williams. And now you've got Ty Dillon becoming the fifth driver to get behind the wheel. I look at the long-term future of the 16 car. We're going to get to talk about that here in just a little bit. But obviously, the 16 car has been a car that is needed funding because last year, AJ Allmendinger drove this car on a full-time basis because he has sponsorship of funding, but Matt Collick doesn't really want to fund out of pocket, and they're going after drivers who bring a little bit of sponsorship with it, which Ty Dillon does have a little bit of sponsorship from my understanding, still to say, with Ferris Mowers, though they've backed off their sponsorship at least a little bit so far in 2024. But in general, when I look at Ty Dillon and look at what I expect performance-wise, I don't think Ty Dillon, unfortunately, is going to set the world on fire this year. I think he's going to struggle a little bit with call. Because call racing really hasn't had the outright pace and speed outside of maybe the road courses this year. And let's be honest, that 16 car that SVG had, that car was prepared by uh, Trackhouse Racing. Though it was a call car, it was prepared inside the Trackhouse Racing shop. And it also was supposed to be a ride that Matt Benedetto was supposed to drive at some point this year, but Matt Benedetto lost his sponsorship to get behind the wheel of the seat. But he maybe at some point we could see him drive. That's something we'll be watching for the rest of the year. Who else gets behind the wheel? I really wish Ty Dillon the best of luck, though. I want to see Ty Dillon succeed in this car and this seat because it'd be really good for him to get some confidence because I know Ty Dillon really wants to get confidence once again, but I'm not really confident Ty Dillon is going to run good in this car. We'll see how he performs, and we'll see what happens in regards and see how Ty Dillon does perform with Call of Racing this weekend in the 16 organization. And now we're going to hedge up onto the next story of today's episode as we're talking about expansion. Now, it was reported by Cowtracer, which is run by people from the Door Bumper Clear Group in Dirty Mo Media, that there are at least two Tier 1 organizations that are looking to expand in 2025. And according to them, they say charters are something to watch for as well. This is no secret. There are a lot of organizations that do want to expand their programs and organizations for 2025. Now, I will talk about all these organizations in a second. But like I mentioned, you're going to need a charter to go ahead to expand to a full-time entry. And right now, charters are going for 40 to $50 million. On top of that as well, the other thing to look at when it comes to the charter market and charter agreement is the charter agreement is still not finalized at the moment right now, and no one knows how the charter agreement is going to work. But charters, like I said, at the moment are worth 40 to $50 million. But let's say these teams do have the money. What organizations are looking to expand? The first organization that is looking to expand, to my understanding, is Trackhouse Racing. Trackhouse Racing right now has five drivers that are under contract and only two charters at the moment. Those five drivers are Rosh Hessein in the one car, which Rosh Hessein is not going anywhere anytime soon. You've got Daniel Suarez in the 99. He won Atlanta Motor Speedway, but even with that win in Atlanta, he is still under contract, and this is a contract year for Daniel Suarez in the 99 car. You've got Zane Smith, 
who's driving a 71 car for Spire Motorsports, but is under contract with Trackhouse Racing. I would imagine that that 71 car could go over to Trackhouse Racing. And then, of course, you have Shane Van Gisbergen, who's driving full-time in the Xfinity Series with Call of Racing, making select starts with Call of Racing as well, though Trackhouse is preparing those entries. And then you've got Connor Zilich. Now, Connor Zilich is not moving up to the Cup Series, at least for the next year or so, but I wouldn't be surprised if he makes his Cup debut at some point in the next year or two, especially with how impressive he's been at the age of 17. So they're going to have to acquire a charter. I think the easiest route is for them to take the 71 Char Carter for Spire Motorsports to take that and put it for Zane. And then SVG takes their charter from Call of Racing. I think Call of Racing is more than likely going to sell their charter and they're going to hand it off to Trackhouse Racing. I think that is going to happen because, of course, with the affiliation of Call and Trackhouse have together, I think that is what is likely going to end up happening. So that's what's happening with Trackhouse. Another organization that's looking to expand is 2311 Racing. 2311 Racing wants to expand to three full-time entries. In fact, they came very close to getting a third full-time car for this year because a lot of people thought that they were going to be leaving Toyota and they were going to be headed over to Chevrolet, to Ford excuse me, in 2024, and Denny Hamlin was going to be driving this seat. Bubba Wallace was going to drive the 23, Tyler Reddick was going to drive the 45, and Denny Hamlin more than likely was going to drive the 67, or he was going to end up driving the number 11 car in a Ford. And a lot of people thought the Super Haas Racing was going to sell a charter. Speaking of which, I think 2011 Racing is that organization that is looking to expand. And I personally do believe that they are going to get a charter from Sewer Haas Racing. Sewer Haas Racing is reportedly rumored to be leaving Ford at the end of this year. And some are speculating that they could head over to Chevrolet as early as 2025. Or back to Chevy, and, or maybe going to Honda if Honda does in fact decide to go ahead and say, hey, we're going to go ahead and join the sport. And I think that because SHR is struggling for funding, they lost Eric on roll, they lost Kevin Harvick, they had opportunities to get drivers like, of course, Kyle Larson, Kyle Busch, Matt Benedetto, Haley Deegan, Zane Smith, you name it, and they didn't get the chance and opportunity. I think Stu Ross Racing will switch manufacturers, hand a charter off to 2311. Now you think about drivers who get by the wheel, Denny Hamlin maybe in the future, maybe somehow Kurt Busch comes out of retirement, maybe Carl Edwards comes out of retirement, who knows at this point. But it's going to be very interesting to watch to see how things go down in regards to expansion for these organizations and teams. RFK could also expand as well as another team. It's been kind of rumored that they do want to expand their Cup Series program, to maybe three or full-time entries in the future. It'll be something to watch for as time goes on and see what teams do, in fact, decide to expand. It'll be something to keep an eye on as time progresses and goes on when it comes to potential expansion organizations. And now we're going to hedge up onto the first of two major stories of today's episode as we're talking about Denny Hamlin once again. Now, it was reported by Adam Cern that Denny Hamlin has revealed that he would like to drive for 2311 Racing one day, but it's not clear whether that would be full-time or part-time. Denny Hamlin continues by saying he's starting to believe that 2311 Racing is an equal to that position. Like I just mentioned a second ago, Denny Hamlin almost did in fact drive for 2311 Racing this season because they were looking to maybe go to Ford for 2024, but that deal fell through. Now, Denny Hamlin, this is not the first time that he has stated that he's been interested in racing for his own organization. Look at Denny Hamlin. Denny Hamlin is starting to get close to the end of his NASCAR Cup Series career. Denny Hamlin at the end of 2024 is going to be 44 years old. Now, Denny Hamlin is currently under contract with Joe Gibbs Racing through, from my understanding, through next year. And at the end of 2025, Denny Hamlin is going to be 45 years old. There is a chance that next year could be Denny Hamlin's final full-time season, but I mentioned the part-time opportunity because Denny Hamlin, I don't know if he's going to want to continue running full-time with 2311 Racing and maybe run one final season in 2026 for his own organization, or he'll run part-time and do it just for fun. Denny Hamlin, if he does in fact decide to run full-time in 2026, Denny Hamlin will be 45 at the start of the 2026 season. 
but he will be turning 46 at the end of that year. And Denny Hamlin will be one of the older drivers running in the sport. Now, would he be competitive? It is certainly possible. But look at 23-11 racing. They are starting to get much quicker and much faster at a really quick rate. And they're starting to show a lot more speed. Tyler Reddick's had race-winning pace in multiple races this year. They're still got to work on their pit crews. We all know that the pit crews have been a major struggle for 23-11 racing in recent years. But they are working to try to make that better. But that still is a major thing that is going to affect them if they ever want to compete for a championship. Those pickers have to start getting better. Though I've seen Bubba Walls have some decent pit stops in the last couple of weeks. And I've seen them improve at least a little bit there. But they are showing a lot more speed. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of interest in Denny Hamlin of going to race over there at his own organization. If Denny Hamlin raced for 23-11 racing, put full focus on the organization and was working to build that program up, I actually do believe that Denny Hamlin would be very, very competitive with the team. He might outrun Tyler Reddick. He might outrun Bubba Walls. Because I think that right now, Denny Hamlin is still a better driver than Tyler Reddick and Bubba Walls, even at a much older age. Because it's very rarely that you see drivers performing this good in their mid-40s. It used to be back day in the comment where drivers would be in their mid-40s and performing very, very good. But it's been kind of a rare thing in recent years because a lot of these younger drivers are a lot younger because Denny Hamill is, no secret, is past his prime. He's back around that age where he's past his prime, but he still is performing very good. Has already got a win this year at Bristol Motor Speedway. But again, you look at Denny Hamill right now, I think he is going to finish his contract with Joe Gibbs Racing. I think 2025 is definitely for sure going to be his final year at JGR, or he might, in fact, finish his full-time career at Joe Gibbs Racing. But like I said, I do think long-term that Denny Hamlin is eventually going to go over and drive for 20 through 11 racing at least part-time. So I don't think Denny Hamlin is going to run full-time with 20 through 11 racing. I think ultimately, if you want my prediction when it comes to Denny Hamlin, I think Denny Hamlin is going to retire from full-time racing at the end of 2025. And I think he goes and runs part-time with 2311 Racing. It just would make a lot of sense. He would be over there to help the organization. And like I said, I think Denny would have a lot more fun racing there on a part-time basis than running full-time. Being on the road 38 to 40 times a week is grueling for especially someone who is getting up there in age a little bit more. It is grueling for someone who is a little bit older of a driver at this point. So yeah, I think it'd be really fun for sure to see Denny Hamill drive for 20 through 11 racing. I know there were a lot of drivers that could have driven for 20 through 11 racing, like a Carl Legwards, like a Kurt Busch, who did drive for 20 through 11 racing. And he's really helped build that program up in recent years. They've had opportunities to get other drivers. I know that Denny probably talked to Matt about then at one point about driving there. But still, going back and talking about Denny Hamill, I do believe that Denny Hamill at some point, yes, I think he will drive for 2311 racing, but I don't predict right now that it is going to be on a full-time basis. As of now, I think it will right now will only be on a part-time basis, and as of right now, I don't think it is going to be on a full-time basis. It's going to be very interesting to see what Denny Hamlin decides to do long-term and forward into the future, see if he does, in fact, decide to change his mind and go full-time next year. I don't think he goes over 2311 racing next year. I think he'll go through his contract in 2025, and then maybe, just maybe, in 2026, he decides to go ahead and race full-time in the NASCAR Xfinity Cup Series full-time with the team. Maybe in one day we'll also see 2311 Racing expand the program into maybe the Xfinity Series and Truck Series as well. In general, it's really interesting to look at, and we'll see what Denny Hamlin decides to do in the not-so-distant future, but I do think he'll at least run part-time with 2311 Racing here very, very soon. And now we're going to head on to the final major story of today's episode as we're talking about Long Beach. Now, this is a rumor that's been going around for the last couple of months, but according to Racer.com and Marshall Pruitt, multiple sources tell Racer that NASCAR has been actively pursuing the 50% stake in the Long Beach race that has been owned by Kevin Cal Cohan for the last few months. Now, obviously, unfortunately, the estate of Kevin Cal Cohen is looking to sell their 50% ownership stake because, unfortunately, Kevin Cohen sadly passed away last year, and they're looking to sell off that 50%. Also, according to Racer.com, Penske Entertainment is trying to block NASCAR's efforts to race there because IndyCar wants to keep racing at Long Beach long term. 
Obviously, it is no secret that NASCAR wants to stay in the Southern California market. We've already talked about Auto Club Speedway, but there's been no construction going on. And a lot of people in the industry are also speculating as well that NASCAR is more than likely not going to be returning to the LA Coliseum in 2025. They're not expected to go back there in 2025. And Ben Kenny has stated many, many times that NASCAR wants to stay in the Southern California market. They're ultimately playing Steve O'Donnell, Steve Phelps, excuse me, has said that they were really pursuing to try to stay in that market in 2025. And it sounds like Long Beach is one of the areas that they have been looking at. Now, personally, it makes way too much sense. There's a lot of factors going in to why this makes a lot of sense for NASCAR to stay in the Long Beach area. One, they go and stay in the Southern California market. Long Beach is really close to the Los Angeles area, so it would make a lot of sense to race at the historic Long Beach circuit. Two, think about the sponsorship that is over at Long Beach. It's Acura Grand Prix. Do you know who owns Acura? Honda. Honda has been extremely frustrated with the way things have been going with IndyCar in the last year or so and with the hybrid situation that's been going on. And Honda is heavily rumored, while it's not officially confirmed at this point, it is heavily rumored that Honda is looking to leave IndyCar at the end of their contract, which is the end of 2026, and they're actively pursuing a potential possibility to join NASCAR as early as the 2026 season, because they're not going to join next year unless they've been secretly working on getting sport as early as next year. They're likely not going to join till the 2026 NASCAR Cup Series season. They've been really frustrated with IndyCar. The third reason why it would make a lot of sense for them to pick up the deal is because of IMSA. NASCAR, which a lot of people probably don't know so are watching this video, but NASCAR currently owns IMSA. They've owned IMSA since 2014. So there, that's another big reason why it would make a lot of sense for NASCAR to go and pick up the deal. NASCAR racing around Long Beach, in my opinion, would absolutely be phenomenal. Now, they could also change up the circuit if they need to because they don't have to exactly go around the fountain because I think someone is unfortunately going to get pushed around in the fountain. And they might have to change up how the course works, but personally, it would make a ton of sense for them to try to get out there and racers. I think it would be really huge for the sport to stay in that market. But it would also be a major and massive loss for IndyCar as well. The Acura Grand Prix of Long Beach has been the second biggest race for IndyCar and the biggest street race IndyCar has had, and it's only the second biggest event outside of the Indianapolis 500. It would be another gut punch for IndyCar if they were to lose the deal. Now, like I've already mentioned and said, Penske is trying to block them out. They would not be trying to block out NASCAR from pursuing this be if there was no real heat and fire to this. And it wouldn't be trying to block this out if NASCAR was not trying to take the day over overall. If they take this day from IndyCar, this is going to be a massive loss for IndyCar in the long term. And IndyCar's already been having a lot of massive losses. You hear all the headlines and stuff. But the question will be, is will the lawmakers side with NASCAR or will they side with the Penske Entertainment Group? If you want my personal opinion, as much as I think IndyCar will have a really good chance of keeping the deal... I think NASCAR more than likely is sadly going to win the deal. NASCAR has more money than the Penske Entertainment Group, and we've been seeing a lot of the headlines and the bad things going on with IndyCar in recent year months. I think that NASCAR more than likely, sadly, will end up winning outright the deal. As much as it pains me to say that, I really want IndyCar to keep Long Beach, and it would be really good for both to work together. I just think right now that IndyCar is in the bad position when it comes to their deals. There's just a lot of things not going well for it. A lot of people are frustrated with the Thermal Club. You think about what's going on with Honda, the delay of the hybrid system, which may not debut until we get to mid-Ohio at this point. It sounds like it's going to be later and later as year progress, and we've got frustration from Honda behind the scenes with the rumors of them potentially leaving, and they could join NASCAR at this point. I just think right now that NASCAR is in a very much better position. And then the other thing you think about, too, is street course racing. There's been a lot of rumors in the last year that, yes, NASCAR has a three-year deal with Chicago street course, but NASCAR needs to find another street course to go to because I don't even know if the Chicago street course is going to be coming back in 2025. I don't think they're going to go outright through the complete contract, and I think that they are going to lose it at the end of 2025, and I think Chicagoland is going to come back next year because we know that that rumor that came out last year, I think Chicagoland will end up getting a date back 
in 2025. That's what I think is going to unfortunately end up happening. As much as it pains me to say this, I thought the Chicago Street Course put on a good show. I just think NASCAR is looking for that backup street course race, and Long Beach would absolutely be the way to go. And personally, I think, no disrespect, I would love to see Chicago come back over Chicago Street Course, so I did enjoy the Chicago Street Course race overall. This is definitely going to be a very important story to watch as time progresses and goes on, but I personally want to see NASCAR go to Long Beach. I think the racing would be really, really good and really fun. Yes, it'd be really hard to get these cars around the track and drivers how aggressive they've been in recent years and recent years. I think there would be a really good chance and possibility for wrecks to end up happening. But at the same token and same time, if NASCAR is bringing the money and they're bringing the stuff, they more than likely are going to end up winning the deal. So it's going to be something to watch for. And again, it could happen as early as next year. The NASCAR is racing at Long Beach. I know there's been rumors of Dodger Stadium coming up, but I think NASCAR is actively pursuing to try to race at Long Beach in 2025. And I think it'd be a really big move for the sport for NASCAR, but I think it definitely would be a massive loss for IndyCar if it does end up happening. So... That is going to be for today's NASCAR news and motorsports news video. One thing, guys, for watching, please subscribe to the channel. The notifications on so if I win a video, it does go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and support me on Patreon as well. Links to the below with that and comment your thoughts below on today's video. Do you think NASCAR is going to head to Long Beach in 2025? Let me your thoughts in the comments below. And do you think Denny Hamlin eventually will join 2311 and drive for his team? Let me your thoughts in the comments below. Later today on the channel, we'll have the NASCAR Xfinity Series race picks for Richmond. Then tomorrow, we'll have the Cup Series race picks for Richmond. And we'll also have the paint scheme preview. Friday, we'll have a NASCAR news video more than likely dropping on the channel. And might have something else dropping later in the day as well. And then on Saturday and Sunday, we'll have race reviews and videos around Richmond. Got a ton of great content dropping on the channel that I cannot wait for you guys to check out. So anyways, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's episode. And I'll see you guys next time for more great, awesome NASCAR content and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, buddy.